if you can't do a pilot and get value in 30 days, then you're with the wrong vendor. Welcome to the first video of the One Clear Thing series. Our today's guest is Eric Simoni, the CEO and co-founder of Clearblade. Eric founded Clearblade in 2007, way before the IoT hype started, and guided it through triumphs and challenges to become the leading IoT solution provider. Hello Eric, it's a pleasure to meet you. Hey Lukas, pleasure to be here. Your professional journey started way before establishing the Clearblade. I, uh, I started in corporate America at IBM in the late 80s. I was a programmer. Air traffic control, big project out in Maryland. Spent a year at Johns Hopkins Hospital doing more programming. Again, I was kind of a, a young mainframe guy back in the day. And then transitioned back into IBM into uh, sales back when the operating system and PC wars were going on. Client server was a big thing. Mid 90s, I moved to the Bay Area and founded a successful startup that's now a company called Proficient. What inspired you to found Clearblade in 2007? Because back then, IoT was not that huge thing. I actually took a few years off from the success I had at Proficient, did a few other things, and then ironically, I had lots of friends at IBM that I had worked with during my past startup, and they asked me to do another one, to help IBM Really in the area of enterprise modernization, how can, we, how can we make older systems newer? And that was really a precursor into the Internet of Things. Taking systems uh, to the next level is always a challenge and yeah. uh, finding right technical solution without disturbing the operations. This is a huge thing and huge need that will stay true as long as we've got the IT as we know it. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's talk about essential milestones in the Clearbait's history. I found most interesting the platform day. You established a tradition of celebrating that day within the Clearblade. So please reveal the secret. What is so special about that day to you and to the entire Clearblade community? Well, you know, if you remember that, that time period, right? So 2007 to you know, 2010, 2011, that was really the explosion of the cloud and mobile devices, right? So we, we were watching this trend and, and Clearblade was adjusting to, we, to be honest, we really didn't like what IBM was doing in mobile and internet of things, nor did we like what GE was doing. We thought they were taking a flawed approach, which is you know, a pretty bold thing to say as a, as a startup company against these big major players. But I find it's really hard for sometimes big companies to innovate in the right way. We liked a, a startup that was in the space called Parse. They were an API first cloud-based startup to really move storage and processing off the mobile phone into the cloud, right? And so we started using these tools at a number of our customers as we were moving the business. And then in 2013, April 25th to be exact, Parse got acquired by Facebook. I took big notice of this because one, Parse was not a big company that they got acquired for pretty decent multiple, I think it was 85 million, and they had, I believe, low $2 million revenue. So, so the venture capitalist in me said, oh my gosh, we've got to do this. They knew Facebook brought them in to really invigorate their mobile app development. And I called up my CTO and said, Aaron, we've got to build this. We've got to build this for the enterprise. And, and that was the lightning bolt moment. It was a platform day. It's April 26th, the next day is when I saw the news. And I woke up that morning and it happened to be in the Bay Area. And it just was one of those moments that you said, this is our opportunity to go build something great. And so I convinced Aaron to take that leap of faith with me. Once you gather enough experience and you are aware of what's going on in the market, you can spot those moments yep. and make the huge breakthrough yep. or at least attempt to make that breakthrough. What is interesting is that most companies provide services but you decided to utilize the platform-centric yeah. approach. So how those two business models differ? Eventually? Massively different. And I think at the time I was a bit naive on how different that is, right? I had built a services company in the past and I had this, just, I had this belief that, oh, we could just take all our consultants and turn them into developers. And, and Aaron informed me, said, Eric, we've got to build a whole new team around this. This is a major pivot. And so once, once we realized that we said, well, we've got to really stick to our vision and ramp down the old business and ramp up a completely new business. 
that was the work that, that I did while Aaron and I divided and conquered. I said, Aaron, you go build this, this vision of this platform. I want it to be cloud native, cloud independent. I don't want to be building on someone else's IP. I want it to scale to millions and millions of devices. I want it to have the concept of edge compute, which was a really early thought, mainly because this pattern was very similar to something I experienced in the nineties when we went to client server. So it seemed like a very common thing. Hey, look, this is going to happen. Edge computing is going to happen. And Aaron took on that mission while I took on the refocus of the business, the, the recalibration, the transition from a services company into a true product company. It is always interesting for me to see those cyclic patterns in IT. As you said, the client server, and now we've got the edge computing, which is yeah. essentially the same. Yeah. We've got the compute at the edge and the server is the distributed application in the cloud. But essentially the concept stays the same. Correct. So this is very, very interesting. And once again, it shows your experience that you are able to spot that patterns and be very early into the, the market. But still, that was a pretty significant leap of faith that you will basically start something from scratch and what was the biggest challenge? You said that you need to start fresh and to create your own tools. Okay. But back in the days, at those very early moments of Cleoblade, uh, what are you sure that this is actually the right move? Or maybe you thought, I probably should have stayed in service <laughs> because I know this domain. Yeah, so you're never sure, right? And and I think what, what colored my opinion was back in the 90s when I did the first business, my original idea was to build a software company. And it was around something fun, fantasy football, NCAA tournament software. And I was convinced not to do that by, by my partners because it was not safe, right? And if I, I always felt like I missed an opportunity during the dot-com because that would have been hugely successful if we stuck to the vision. And so this time I felt like we got a second chance. I got a second chance to do something and that vision you need to stick to that vision. So, so being an entrepreneur is ne never safe, right? And, and you have to have that confidence and that conviction and that passion to continue to move forward. And you've got to do it with a team of people that share that vision. You've got to bring in really smart people that are really dedicated to software development and, and have the resilience and passion along with you to, to succeed. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not easy. It's, it's a constant grind. But in the end, it is so rewarding as you overcome those challenges and, and gain success. That is so true. So if you know what you're doing, that means that you started too late, essentially. <laughs> exactly. Right? Exactly. And what are the biggest opportunities that are created by this platform centric approach that are very hard to get where you just focus on services? Yeah. So, so the opportunities are to provide software that constantly evolves. I have a lot of experience in building a services company. At a services company, it's, it's serviceware. There's nothing wrong with that. They're frameworks. I was an expert in frameworks, but it's a very different approach than building software for multiple customers that's consistent. So you have to remain disciplined. You have to kind of cut the cord of the services safety net, as I would call it because you won't think like a product company unless you're forced to survive like a product company. So it took some time for us to really transition into that, into that way of thinking. But when you're forced to survive on your product, then your product better be the best possible product that it can be. That was one of the hardest things was to continue just to have the patience and the resilience to keep making it better, keep making it better and not to follow the conventional wisdom of others, right? There, there are a lot of players in IOT, especially several years ago, and we, we did it very different than everybody else. Essentially what we created was an IOT operating system, as opposed to what I would call a platform. Um, these are semantics, but we, we've had people look at our software and they, they, they just say, wow, you built this completely different from everybody else in the industry. And so you're either going to, you're either going to thrive or, you, or you're not, and it's going to be survival of the fittest. Yeah, that is so true that if you stick with your beliefs and your vision, you either win big or, or lose big. Right? There is yeah. no in the middle no, most isn't. of the time. Let's talk about the hopes and dreams versus the reality. 
what are the unique problems associated with the IoT industry? Because it is not purely about applications anymore. We've got that T, which is a thing with our devices, yeah. and you mentioned the, the edge computing. So what were the unique problems that you had to solve back in the days when that was not that common approach and everyone was basically doing something else? You had to succeed um, where others had failed. And sometimes that's outside of your control, right? A lot of this is about business and about providing solutions that customers need, regardless of technology, right? And, and one of the big challenges for us was we were so technology focused, we kept selling how great our technology was. And in the end, what customers need is, is great solution. There were lots of failures, and still are in IoT, from, from this build first approach. And we had to have success early from a product approach and, and so advising those customers, having, having successes and failures, and then learning from that and putting it back into the product was really a big part of our evolution. How do you decide what goes into product and what does not belong in the product, right? What is specific to a customer versus what can apply to all customers cross vertical, right? That's a very, very challenging problem to solve. And it only happens over time. We had to stay very disciplined in their engineering not to build what, what, what we would call internally a Frankenstein for everybody, but something that's consistent, that applies to all customers, but continues to evolve the product so it continues to get better and better. You mentioned the first customers, and uh, this is a great segue to my next area of interest, which is building a platform is a significant undertaking, both from the design and the development perspectives, but technology is not the only factor. And at the end of the day, as you just pointed out, customers does not really care about technology, they care about the product and the benefit. You created a solution that uh, tightly integrates with the business operations of your customers, and uh, you need to make them trust you that mm -hmm. you will keep providing that solution because all of a sudden their business depends on right. your product. So how have you managed to convince those first customers to trust you and to continue develop and operate with you? Well, so first, our early customers were the ones that did the most due diligence on the product, right? And we had tremendous success there. We were going up against IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, ThingWorks, right? These are these are big established IoT companies, but there was something missing, right? They they were not having success in IoT because it was early IoT, and I think the entire industry underestimated the complexity of IoT. And one of our very early customers did like a nine-month comprehensive study and bake-off and scoring system, and that was the aha moment for us when we came out on top, like not just by a little bit by a long shot. And the biggest challenge with this customer was the size of Clearblade versus the size of these other companies, right? How can I rely on, on you? And that was that was the harder part of, of getting the deal done was sitting in a room and saying, look, we're committed to IoT. This is all we do. We've had past success. I as an entrepreneur had past success. And then also we made you know some plans that said, hey, look, if for some reason Clearblade weren't to be viable, then you put your software into escrow and, and you move on. So you have to you have to take those risks and really establish a partnership with that company. And and, and that's really many of our early customers. We run through that process. Um, you know, we have the you know a large aerospace manufacturer that trust trusted in us early. We've got uh, one of the major rail companies that that was the first to deploy edge computing uh, in a major way with Clearblade. And, and uh, that was because they had a problem to solve um, and, and they trusted us. And then, a, you know, really our, one of our biggest customers today, it's a large HVAC company called Ream, and they've been a really great partner over the years because we've really looked at it like a partnership and not a vendor customer relationship. And we work with them to successfully transform what was an initial failed attempt to build on their own. At the end of the day, companies do not buy from companies, people buy from people, right? Correct. It was the key factor of signing those deals and basically putting your name on the line yep. that you will stick with your convictions and you will 
try to your best to deliver yeah. because there is no such thing as a perfect solution right and uh, yeah. there is no way in convincing anyone that your solution is perfect but uh, if they see that you are really committed and you are doing your best uh, they will trust you yeah. speaking about uh, Clueblade's functionalities how much of those are essentially developed by you for the customers customers reach out to you and said that they need those specific functionalities in order to operate their business that's 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 a great question because early on it was us building what we thought the market needed right and we and we got a lot of things right and one of our peers back in the day was a company called telemetry and in 2015 amazon bought telemetry and that was one of the scary moments for Clearblade, which is oh my gosh we're going up against amazon right sticking to that convection. But once we transition to working with our customers and really listening to what they needed, where they were having issues or where they wanted features and functions. And we took that input from a, a wide swath of businesses, right? Companies in transportation, companies in building systems, companies in energy. And it was the discipline of listening to those customers provide feedback to us and the engineering team staying disciplined to say, look, is this a, a product feature that we should add and how should we add it? Or is this a specific one-off that's a customization that should stay outside of the product? And that's been the constant balance that we've had to maintain for the last many years. And now over hundreds of customers, I think that's the advantage, right? You're not customizing and building based on a framework of code you're incorporating valuable features uh, into your product and staying disciplined to say this applies to all hundreds of customers and, and they may want this feature. That's becoming a true product company. You mentioned the big names in the industry like Google, IBM and AWS, and it is always intimidating to be in the competition with those huge players because of the number of resources they've got. But looking from the perspective, those big names like Google, IBM actually decided to shut down their IoT departments yeah. and offerings. And you're still in the market, you're still in the game, actually growing and uh, serving more and more customers. So what was the secret sauce that despite that uh, huge uh, difference in terms of resources, Clearblade survived yeah. and is evolving? and other companies failed to create a profitable business in the IoT yeah. domain. There, there are a number of factors here. One, just look at the size of an IBM or a Google, right? They have revenue from lots of other areas, right? So, so it's smart for them, to be honest, to look at areas that are taking more time or they're not having as much success in revenue-wise versus expense to pivot it to different strategies. So that's, that's one disadvantage of going with a bigger company because it may seem safer but they change strategies often. I've also experienced working at a very big company like IBM and being a, a, an entrepreneur for, for 30 plus years. And, and I really feel like it's hard to innovate in big companies. Not that you can't do it, but there's lots of competing factors. There's lots of, again, sacred cows, right? You have revenue streams from certain products and typically you're not gonna be left alone to really innovate and think differently. So usually the best ideas come from smaller companies and, and it's in that incubation that the big companies end up acquiring smaller companies to add to their innovation, right? So the timing is key on this. So I think it's an advantage to have a small team of developers that have been dedicated for five, 10 plus years. And I'm also a big believer in building in-house for really critical products, not to say you can't leverage some outsource capabilities, but I prefer to have dedicated teams of, of, of people that are W2 employees that, that, will, that will stay with you. And so I think that's an advantage, right? You can think differently, you can build differently, and you have to, you, you, it's survival of the fittest, you have to survive. So typically the big companies follow the same playbooks. If you look at IoT in general, the conventional wisdom, everybody followed the same playbook. There were 400 companies that had very similar products built with in the very similar way. There was no real differentiation, so it takes, a company like ours to take a leap of faith to say, you know what, we're going to approach this very differently and we're either going to succeed or we're going to fail. That's a great point and it uh, shows the difference in perspective. 
for you it is all or nothing right you yeah. you are in the iot domain and you are forced to innovate sometimes to find some very creative solutions just to survive and those big uh, companies they've got huge portfolios so they can as you said operate on different level yeah. and uh, optimize the global income not the income from a specific industry and in your case uh, i think that is a huge advantage when you talk with the customers you say this is th there is no other option for me yeah. either we will make that happen and iot will work or not right so it's not like i'm going to shut down the cleveland platform tomorrow because i've got other stream of revenue this is single thing and that's why i'm fully committed yeah, so correct. i think that's a great point and you, you touched on something very important as well the team of people because the company is just a team of people and for those huge enterprises more or less those are kind of random people most of the time and the rotation is pretty big how have you managed to build a team that is fully dedicated dedicated the same as you are yeah. in clear blades mission i think what helps is i i am a, a computer scientist I, I did what these people did back in the in the 90s even though i don't do it today i have an understanding of what it is to be an engineer and i think from the top down that that permeates the company that we are an engineering first company and and the people that we bring on are of the of the highest quality. I know every company says that, right? But I'll be honest that it's really hard to become an engineer here at Clearblade. And I've been really impressed from the CTO down at, at the, the talent level and the dedication. Some of the folks that we have here are, you know, they've got master's degrees from very prestigious universities. They could have gone anywhere. They, they've been recruited by Google, Microsoft, still are <laughs> recruited heavily by my competitors. And they stay, and they stay because of the mission. And that's not just because of the vision or because I'm such an eloquent speaker or visionary. It's because of the work, right? They're working on really, really interesting problems. And the challenge uh, every day is great. And I really do think people that develop software for a living, that's when you're the happiest, is when you're building something that you know means something, that you know is going to market. When you're at a big company, like I did this, I was part of a 600 person development team. And I believe that after the two years of work, staying up late, all nighters, right? None of my code ever saw production. And when you put that sort of time in and that sort of, that sort of commitment and love into your work to not have it used is, is really deflating. And, and I believe that that's why at least on the engineering side of the business, people are, are so committed here at Clearblade and, and they've, we also have a very good internship program, and I've been really impressed with interns that started with us over 10 years ago are now leading major areas of our engineering team, and that just shows commitment. And that's in, most of them are based in Austin, Texas, which is a very competitive tech market, and they stay with Clearblade. For IT folks, for developers, for programmers, it is devastating if you build something, like put your heart in it, and uh, someone puts that on the shelf, because... Yeah someone decided not to ship that product, right? And right. Uh, the thing is that not that the product was poor or what, like you've done everything your best according to the book and uh, someone just decided to, to, to right. postpone or even cancel it. Being a developer myself, money does not compensate that feeling that you are just uh, in the wrong place. Yep. You don't care how much money you earn. You don't care how the brand looks in your CV. You just feel that's not the right place for you anymore. Yep. So that's exactly yeah, the I mentality. Think, that's exactly it. Yeah. So I, I think that is is huge. And interns, so building those capabilities from the inside, that uh, really helps you to build the company's uh, culture. And I don't like this term, company's culture, because the number of huge brands use that, yeah. and uh, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. But if you've got uh, a small team that knows each other very well, that is fully committed, you can actually feel the culture and that th there is no way to fake it. Nope. It's either Agreed. is there or not. Yeah, culture happens organically from within. And it's it's not necessarily written down on your website. You know, we, we've actually tried to codify it lately because as you grow, you want it, you want the, the, the teamwork to, to 
and respect and to, to continue to grow with the company. But culture happens every day with every interaction between employees, between customers, and it's not something that's manufactured or driven by fancy offices and, and foosball tables and, and, and so forth. In fact, Clearblade's primarily virtual since the pandemic, and it's really been a benefit to our developers because they're able to have the flexibility that they need, and they collaborate in an amazing way over tools like Zoom and Slack and Confluence and so forth, right? So I've been really proud of the evolution of Clearblade in that way and, and seeing the teamwork. And when you have a highly functional team, it makes it much easier to be to be a, a leader of, of folks. And it's then my responsibility to maintain that culture and, and, and really help guide the company to success because really I work for them. That is so true. And from my experience, the company culture, this is the hardest thing to scale. As you said, like once you grow, you need to hire more and more people and that puts your company at risk in a way from the culture perspective. So being the role model as you are, putting yourself first, let you work for them, yes. you will move the roadblocks away so they can focus on yes. their craft. I think that's that's huge. Yeah. When I when I so, was younger, this this was in my head in my twenties because I felt like I was too constrained, right? I couldn't I couldn't use my brain. And I said if I'm ever in a position of power, I'm gonna remember what it was like to be to be limited and, and don't do that with people that, that work at, at our company. Give them the freedom to create, respect their talent. And, and find a way to have all that, that work together. So it's worked out very well here. Our conversation started in ancient times of the year 2007. Let's shift our focus to the current day. Okay. Clearblade offers a very specific solution called ClearRail. Could you summarize that service for everyone watching us? This was an answer to the customers in the rail space. You know, we, we started with BNSF, we've got Canadian National, we've got Chicago Metro, we did you know, really in a, in a very interesting space, we did some very interesting things, right? At the behest of our customers, hey, we need the software to do this, to monitor these, these types of equipment. It really started before we had product, right? We had our edge product, we had our platform product, but this really led to creating a product that's specific for rail, that you basically out of the box could put in the hands of business users and not have to bring in the technical team to, to make adjustments. And so we kept focusing on how do we make it easier for operators in the rail industry to monitor things like crossings and locomotives and switches and so forth. And we had a lot of success at that. And that really led to the aha moment back in 2020 of us saying, wow, let's create clear rail as a product, but also let's, let's take this idea and broaden it to something called intelligent assets where we could we can create similar products per vertical but create one application layer that delivers that solution because the struggle we saw not just from our rail customers but from ream and hvac from um, our aerospace customer from our customers across the board was as great as clearblade was it still took them too long to get to a solution and we said wow let's why don't we take the success we had in ClearRail and, and build a product called Intelligent Assets? And, and that really led to that, that evolution of, of that product. You mentioned something extremely important from the business perspective, which is time to value. And you said that you can build something using ClearRail, but it might take too long for some customers. So you decided to utilize your capabilities and on top of the framework that you already created, build a purpose product like uh, Krill Rail. So could you give us some idea regarding the reduced time to value when using that product versus using something more yeah. generic? So Clear Rail, target at the rail industry, you can put it in the hands of business users, people that, that operate machinery on the, on the railways. And in a matter of days, teach them how to customize the software without dropping into any code, use the language and, and the terms that they're used to in the rail industry, they end up having a product that they can use within a matter of days. The feedback we got from the folks in the rail space that said, my gosh, we've been waiting for this from our own internal departments for the last 10 years. And now I have this out of the box. And, and my other vendors that supply me hardware 
aren't giving me the same experience. So now I can separate the hardware from the software. I can commit to ClearBlade software. And now when I need different types of hardware, I can buy that hardware and have ClearBlade installed on that hardware along the rail. That gave them tons of flexibility, a big return on investment, and really flexibility in their, in their buying power with, with their other vendors. And again, that led to the bigger aha moment for us, which is, wow, if we can make clear rail a product, let's take what we learn there and make intelligent assets a flexible product for any vertical and then allow people to customize it per vertical. You cannot go too narrow in the IoT domain. As you said, if you go extremely deep into some very specific niche as the rail industry, all of a sudden, those people that are not IT professionals, they can use your product basically out of the box without almost any training. And this is win-win scenario, because for you, this is obvious win because this opens up the market, mm. but for them is also a win because uh, they do not have some generic IT solution that they don't really understand how to work with and what's the value proposition. You use their language, you use uh, their approach, their way of making things done. And uh, that is yeah. really, really perfect match in my yeah. opinion. And we're disrupting so, the custom build. This is, I've been saying this for years, right? As, as again, a former developer and um, leader of a, of a services company, nothing wrong with system integrators. They're, 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 they're valuable partners, they're necessary. But lots of these companies spend too much money, too much time custom building a solution that, that takes too long, it's too long to return on investment. And then what they fully underestimate is the maintenance of that product over years and years and years and staying up on security issues or just feature function. It's massive. And this is what has to change for IoT to be successful. We can't be custom building everything for a railway, everything for a city, everything for a country solution, right? There has to be some products to tie this all together and, and, and create what I call intelligent infrastructure. So this is, this is the shift that I'm seeing starting to happen in IoT across the board. That's a huge point. The long time vision and maintenance of what you're building, because in software, one day we are using this tool, the other way we are using some other tool and everything integrates using APIs and we are accustomed to that. Yeah. But the industrial internet of things or the internet of things in general, yeah. this is totally different approach. Like the rail or other customers, they do not expect you to, to change your stack completely and ask them to reinstall your software on a fleet of devices. Like You need to ensure that you will continue to support that deployment, you will add additional features, you will solve potential security issues, and all of that needs to just operate because uh, they trust in you. And I believe this is something that is so, so critical about the brand that you created. People or the business owners can trust you because you are fully committed and you understand the field of the Internet of Things and you understand, as in this specific example, their very narrow domain that they care about. Correct. So that's a huge point. You mentioned the intelligent assets and digital twin is a trendy topic in the Internet of Things domain. I've seen it done the wrong way most of the time. Very few components actually managed to pull this off and uh, implement it properly. From the clear blades offering, the intelligent asset is out of the box digital twin solution that actually works what it enables to the business users, to the professionals that are not IT professionals, but want to leverage modern IT capabilities into their respective yeah. domains. So this, again, I, I refer to it, our success with ClearRail led to this, this aha moment, which says, gosh, uh, we need to provide this functionality to all our customers in a way that's flexible, in a way that provides immediate ROI, and in a way that puts it in the hands of the business user. And I think that's the big gap we've had in IoT for the last decade. It's been too many engineers building things and not having great commercial success. And this is the way software goes through the history of time, right? You start out building custom and then someone has an idea that says, hey, wouldn't this, this be nice if we created a thing called a database, right? You go way back in time. 
this is the evolution of the Internet of Things. When you can, when you can out of the box give the capability to the end user to to define what their assets are, uh, define their digital twin. Now we we avoided the term digital twin in the product name because the idea of digital twin was so amorphous. Digital twins meant a lot of things, and it usually meant what I would call more science experiment digital twins. I've got a jet engine and I'm gonna test it in my, my lab, in my virtual lab, but it's not connected all the time. So the way that we thought of digital twins is this is gonna be an active asset, an asset that's streaming data live. And so it's really an idea of a connected digital twin or an active digital twin. So my railroad crossing is streaming data 24 seven. My, my electric vehicle is streaming data 24 seven and I can define what attributes I want out of that physical device. I don't need every aspect of the physical device. I just need the things that I want to measure, which may be a battery level, it may be the speed, temperature, vibration, you name it. And that's in the hands of the operator. You don't have to go to IT, you don't have to go to a system integrator to say, do this for me. Yet, we play nice with the developers and, and the IT department and the system integrator says, okay, you can get all this functionality out of the box, but if you want to open it up and you want to get in there and do more custom things, we give you that ability to. And it's been a huge success in the market. And this is a much higher evolution from things like an IoT core product, right? Or even our enterprise product that lets a customer build whatever they want. This gives them an application out of the gate that runs wherever they want to run it, you know, at the edge, in, the, in whatever cloud they want or on-premise and gives them an application to start with. And I think that's what IoT is missing is that give them 80, 90% out of the box and then let them customize the rest themselves. The next step of the IoT evolution, as you described, we started with just trying to connect various devices to backend systems, then to the cloud. But this is just engineer thinking about connecting a piece of silicon to the internet. There is nothing good for business operator by doing just that. What the business actually needs is a solution and creating that out of the box intelligent asset that provides the application layer just for the start. That shows the business owner the value and it lets them to verify the use case because yeah. uh, it might happen that for a specific domain actually internet of things does not really bring the value yeah. and you want to know that answer as quickly as possible not after let's say six months of custom development yeah. and i think this is also something that is maybe not obvious but it's a huge benefit of your approach is that you provide this solution out of the box someone can test it validate it yeah and okay. decide if they want to go all in with your stack because they see yeah. the business value or they prove their solution is not really ready for right. IoT. I, I, tell, I tell people and companies all the time, if, if you can't do a pilot and get value in 30 days, then you're with the wrong vendor. You're going down the wrong path. You've got to be able to show this in a short amount of time and then build on that. And I think that's, that's where we've had a ton of success. Like I said before, IoT over the last 10 years has been mostly experimentation and failure, and companies are frustrated. They spent millions and millions of dollars. They built up teams that haven't been able to deliver on their promises. And I think that's some of the, the, the resistance we get is there's te internal teams that, hey, look, my job is to build this. Software like Intelligent Assets and Clearblade disrupt that. But what we found is those same teams over time when they work with us, when when they see their their end users, uh, their operators having success, and then they say, okay, we, we want to learn what's going on here. We want to integrate. They realize, oh, wow, this is a very flexible piece of software that we can, we can tie in things that we've already built. So we take a yes and approach to our software here at Clearblade, which is play nice with others, play nice with all software, and let the data flow to where the company wants it to flow. And, and usually engineers once they get to know what we're delivering, really embrace that. That's a great approach, not to force someone to use y your full stack, let them decide on their own. And this creates the trust and the foundation for the long-time relation. Looking past the current hype around the uh, AI, 
How does AI apply to Internet of Things domain from your perspective? Yeah, they're synonymous, right? Uh, IoT feeds AI, right? That the most abundant data in the world is machine data. So what's going to fuel all this, this AI revolution? It's going to be data we get from our machines. It's driven more edge adoption. People want to put their AI at the edge. So to me, AI is the killer app for the edge use case. What I love about this proliferation of AI is now companies are recognizing, look, the value I'm getting out of my systems are in the analytics and the AI, not building the software plumbing or the application, right? So how, how, do, I, how do I get there? And when you can deploy something like ClearBlade and stream that data into any AI system that you like, right? Any AI tooling. Right. We have partnerships with SaaS, we have partnerships with Google, we stream into their products. But if you're using whatever AI, we stream that data natively into those systems as well. So that flexibility is key. So I, I love the synergy between IoT and AI, and I'm seeing many of our customers really lean in and start to make sense of their data. One other point on this is intelligent assets has a huge value on the AI side because Part of AI is getting quality data and data that has more context in it, tag data and, and contextual information. And intelligent assets provides that. You not only get the data from the operators who now are saying, this is what my asset looks like, and this is the data I'm sharing, but also this is how I'm using that asset. These are the rules and alerts. All of that gets fed into analytics and AI. So you now have a much more structured and quality data set to then build your inferencing off of. Speaking about AI, Clibrate created the Gen AI chatbot. Yeah. Uh, could you summarize the business intent behind this uh, solution? Yeah. So this, this was a funny one because we typically take a while to look at new technology, say, yeah, we, we don't see value there. Like for example, blockchain, there was, you know, if you remember several years ago, blockchain was everything. And we had people telling us, oh, you have to build blockchain in your product. And, I'll give Aaron credit on this. He says, I don't see the need. I'm not getting the request from the customers to do this. So we're not going to build it in until I see a really valid use case. Gen AI was similar. At the beginning, we were saying, what's the use case for our customers? And then it became pretty clear that the, the initial low hanging fruit for Gen AI was this makes intelligent assets easier to use, right? Instead of, and I've, I've used it, it's fantastic. Instead of going into intelligent assets and clicking around and creating my digital twin, my, you know, I use an example where I create police vehicles. I can now use the intelligent assets, Gen AI chatbot and say, please create 47 police cruisers in this location. And I want to measure their speed, their vibration, their fuel level, et cetera. And it will go and within our product, create all of those digital assets. It's fascinating. So what used to take me an hour or two takes me five minutes to go do. And that's just the beginning of what we, we've, we launched back in April. We're now ingesting actual manuals for physical equipment where you can actually again get the connectivity out of the box by just using this digital assistant. So I, I, I've got strong beliefs here around Gen AI. Gen AI is a valuable tool if you have functioning software that now you can hydrate with this information. It's not, it's great if you, you know, look, everyone knows you can write an email, you can write abstracts, you can write documents, but the real business value in IoT is having a, a, a productive piece of software that's already structured that you can now create a more natural human to machine interface. So not only with the chat bot, but you can do this with voice, right? You can start to say, say you're in the field and I say, look, I want to connect up this railroad crossing and I want to measure these things. You could speak into your mobile device and then have that automatically happen. I think we're going to see some amazing advances with Gen AI and things like intelligent assets over the next several quarters. That is a fascinating topic. We'll cover it in details during our future episode with Aaron Alsbrook, the ClearPlate CTO. So stay tuned. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. So what is your next big thing you see in the IoT domain? You said that the AI will explode in a good way yeah. and we will see the actual adoption. Do you see any other thing that is maybe not as hyped as AI, but uh, got huge potential? Yeah, so, so everyone's, uh, I'm going to talk about AI a little bit 
because Gen AI is interesting and I love the human to machine interface and what we can do there. But I think we're underestimating traditional AI, right? Where the value in IoT is being able to take AI models that have maybe been built 10, 20 plus years ago and unleash them from the cloud and move them to the edge and have them interoperate with a product like intelligent assets. So instead of an operator needing to build rules that are basically, if this happens, then do this, I'm going to be able to do dynamic inferencing or that operator will by taking AI that they built in the cloud and moving it to the device itself, right? And then having that device alert the right people when something is, is out of norm or know how to adjust itself to avoid a breakdown, right? There's, there's lots that I'm seeing our customers do over the last year in that space that has me very, very excited. So I do think that's a natural evolution of IoT is the incorporation of traditional narrow AI along with Gen AI. And I think we're going to get past the hype of Gen AI is going to do everything. And, and I don't even want to get started on what artificial general intelligence mean. I think that's overhyped as well. I think we're going to start to see real use cases where we're going to get real value. The one thing that I always point to too is something that most of us can relate to our homes, right? Uh, anyone that's tried to do IoT in your home, you find out it's it's very difficult, right? I want to get my lights to do this. I want my audio system to do this. I want my video, I want my sprinkler, all of it. It's a disaster. I'll believe in the real emergence of AI when I can sit in my home and I can give verbal commands like I'm on the uh, uh, on the uh, command deck of, 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 of Star Trek Enterprise System, right? And say, make this happen. I want to watch this channel. I want this the, 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 the light to do to this. Uh, I want to, to start dinner. Then you're going to see that the promise of AI is being delivered. And I think that's that's coming, but it's going to be a few years. I don't think it's right around the corner. I think I think then you're seeing multiple different companies, multiple different pieces of equipment, vendors interoperating in a natural way. And it's and really AI is there to make human interaction with machines much more natural. That's a great point. And this is my thought as well, that using smartphones, tablets, or, or even laptops, this is not natural no. interface for humans to cope, right? right? We get used to smartphones, so we feel like they are natural, but this is just a piece of plastic that is no way right. near to the things uh, we normally do. Like we verbally communicate with each other. We use hand, hand gesture. We use all of that, right? Yeah. And with uh, our current state of the art, we are limited to those right. uh, screens and, and all of that. And all the news goes to the billions being spent on GPUs and big data centers. And that's, that's a very few set of companies, right? I think that you're going to see uh, a lot of the real evolution and innovation around AI happen at smaller companies that leverage some of the, the big investments, but not everyone needs to spend billions of dollars on building GPU data centers. You can do this with traditional AI. You can do this with traditional compute, right? You didn't even need that at the edge. So I think that the messaging gets lost in this big, what I call AI arms race. And there's lots of companies that are going to innovate in very interesting ways in their specific domains. Totally. And actually, this is a huge opportunity for you since you are very focused and you see the true potential of technology. Those big brands, they might compete for the fame, mm -hmm. sort of speak, mm -hmm. and will lose in the long run because they will build something no one really needs on a daily basis. Yeah. And you will use, let's say, simpler tools, not as fancy, yeah. but they will deliver the promise. And this is what we need to do as IoT professionals to make our world a better place, essentially. Yes, correct. We covered a number of topics today, starting from Cleoblade's origins, the initial challenges, the critical decisions, navigating IoT business in times where big players decided to let it go. And we concluded with a few cutting edge offerings that you've got right now and what you see in the future. That's a lot of information. If you could deliver a single message to our viewers, what would that be? Don't try to build this stuff on your own, right? It's, 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 you know, a lot of people say we want to own our IP, this and that. Well, 
to me, the analogy I use is would you build your own operating system from the ground up, leverage technology like ClearBlades, and then demand ROI in a very short period of time? Because that's what every vendor should be, should be delivering. There's so much business value to these folks to deliver the higher level analytics and AI that we just talked about. There's so much to do. Why attempt to build something that's taken us over a decade and we're still committed to doing product releases, several product releases every month. So, so you have to be maniacally focused on the improvement of software. And if your business is, is transportation, if your business is energy, if your business is buildings or something else, then you're taking the, the eye off the ball of your business and you're building at too low of a level. So this is the mistake that I've seen many, many companies make is putting too much money, really burning too much money and building and from the ground up and, and really try these things out. You've got nothing to lose by, by seeing what type of return on investment you can get in a short amount of time. That is very true that uh, reinventing the wheel from the very beginning does not really push your company uh, that far ahead and uh, leveraging expertise of others and building the application layer, the domain specific layer, the business layer on top of the foundations that you created. That is actually the, the way to go. I fully support that approach. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for this fantastic conversation. We covered the business perspective and the strategy today. In the upcoming conversation with Aaron Asbrook, the CTO at Clearblade, We'll focus on tactics and technical implementations of lots of topics that we covered today. So thank you so much for sharing your experience and providing all of those insights. Wukat, thank you for, for having me. It's always wonderful to talk with you and your guided conversation is wonderful. Thank you everyone who is watching us. Please put your questions in the comments because we will answer them live during the live stream that will conclude this video series. Thank you for watching. I'm your host. Łukasz Malinowski.